Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I think we'll get started here in just a minute. We're going to give folks a few more seconds to join us and then we'll get started. All right, welcome to the Return to Campus Living webinar. We are so glad you have joined us. Um, this evening, I am joined by a few of my colleagues and we'll take a few seconds to introduce ourselves and then we'll be um, off and running. My name is Christy DeSantis. I'm the Director of Administration and Assessment and Housing and Residence Life. I've been here a little longer than 16 years in a couple of different roles. Um, and the unit that I manage includes our housing assignments, off-campus student services, Niner Choice, and department-wide assessment. And so again, we're so glad you joined us. And I will kick it over to Carla Hines to introduce herself. Good evening, all. My name is Carla Hines. I'm the Associate Director for Administration. Uh, I've been here 20 years, and uh, I am over the assignments application Team and uh, look forward for the rest of the evening. I'm going to kick it over to Elizabeth. Hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Davis. I serve as the Assistant Director for Assignments here in Housing and Residence Life. I've been at Charlotte for about four years now and support Carla and Christy on the Assignments team. All right. So again, we are so glad you're here. Um, as you might've noticed, we're recording this webinar to be able to post later for those who are unable to join us this evening. Our goals are pretty simple this evening. We want to provide as comprehensive an overview of return to campus living as we can in the short time we have with you, um, share some important context for the changes that we are making, address many of the questions you so helpfully provided to us when you registered, um, we'll do that over the course of the next 30 minutes or so, and then we'll save some time at the end for some questions. And so you can put those in the Q&A. We'd recommend that you hold off until you know that we're closer to the end of the presentation, because most of your questions might be answered um, in the course of, um, of our presentation this evening. Unfortunately, due to time limitations, we won't be able to address every question. Um, that we get, but if at the end of the session you have questions that you didn't get answered, there'll be ways um, at the end of the presentation for you to reach out and contact us. So we'll begin at the beginning um, because I know that while we have probably some folks who have been around for a bit, uh, we also have some parents and students out there who are not familiar with our a lot of our nomenclature. Return to campus living, you will see it referred to as RTCL simply because it is a, a lot of words. Uh, RTCL basically gives current students the opportunity to hand select a specific space for the upcoming uh, academic year. Now, the critical thing in this first bullet point is they get to do this by participating in RTCL. They get to apply and select a hand space, uh, hand selected space before we actually begin assigning new incoming students. So that's the whole advantage of participating during this priority uh, period. Um, current students must participate in RTCL if they are interested in living on campus. So if you are thinking I can wait and I can just do it later, that will not be an option uh, in order for you to be able to I have a good chance of living on campus. Uh, RTCL is a little different than some of the other uh, processes also. It, you use a, um, you apply for housing uh, in that part one application will ask you to do a number of things plus sign a contract. And then two, you actually are able to go and select your own space. That's why it's different. Whereas our new incoming students do not get to select their space. They are assigned by us. Uh, we've listened to the feedback of students over the course of many years, and most recently, 
And we were asked to simplify the process. That goes hand in hand with some other changes that are coming for our university. So we're happy to do this. So we're gonna take a look at some of those changes. Um, so you see on the left side, there are some points that um, were critical in previous years. And then on the right side is gonna be some changes that are new this year. So just to run through those quickly, um, typically our application opens November 1st. Um, this year we will open Return to Campus Living in January. So January 22nd is the date to mark on your calendar. Um, that is because we are making some changes. We wanted to make sure that we had time to implement those well um, and to inform all of our students about those changes, finalize everything. So we have pushed it to January this year. And again, January 22nd would be the date that you want to mark on your calendar. In the past, we've also had multiple phases. So typically, uh, return to campus living would take place over the full month of November. Um, and there were many different steps um, or phases that students could participate in. We did receive feedback that that should be simplified. So we've eliminated most of the phases. So now it will simply be um, a time where students will first take that first step and apply during the first week. Um, and then they'll receive a lottery number and then uh, we'll go through an open room selection. Um, whereas in the past, again, there, there were some other options for them. Uh, timing of the application. So again, it, it was previously open for a whole month. This time around, we have condensed it to try to um, help students in navigating that process. We want to try to um, allow them time to apply. Um, it gives our team some time to really take a look at what, um, what we're working with um, and be able to support our students as best we can. Um, one of the benefits of the of participating in return to campus living is that students who do participate in this process are not required to pay a application fee. So um, that has been waived in the past um, and we will continue that for this upcoming year. And then uh, last year we did see record demand. We had to take a pause in the middle of the process and so because of that, again, we are condensing it this year. Um, and that's why some of these changes have come about due to that tremendous demand. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that later on. Our cancellation deadline has also moved up. So previously it was June 1st. Um, if you were to decide to cancel your application for any reason, you could do so by June 1st without any uh, financial obligation this year, uh, we have moved that up to April 1st. So that's an important date that you wanna definitely keep in mind and make sure that you um, have on your calendar. Um, looking over to that right side, I do wanna just um, review a couple of other points that we've gone through. So as I mentioned, um, we've eliminated some of those phases. And so we're gonna talk more about what that means, but this year we are gonna, um, move to a lottery-based system. So this is a randomized system where students will receive a lottery number. Um, and so that will look a little bit different in terms of open room selection. Uh, we also are limiting the roommate groups um, so that those can only be made up of two people. Um, previously, there could be up to four. This year, it will just be two. And then lastly, we have uh, made a change to our inventory in terms of what is um, allocated for first year only buildings. We are adding Oak Hall and Hunt Hall to that list. I do wanna note the, um, the note at the bottom. Um, so the application right now will be available for students to apply January 22nd through January 26th. It's important to understand though that should we receive a record number of applications um, that we feel exceeds the bed spaces we have available, we may close that application before January 26th. So, so definitely we encourage students um, to participate in that application period early on. Um, and we'll talk more about that throughout our evening tonight.
Okay. So as Elizabeth mentioned, um, one of the biggest changes is the shift to a lottery-based open room selection. So we want to talk a little bit more about what that means. So once students have completed an application, um, they will, on the 26th, receive an email from us with their lottery number. Those lottery numbers will correspond with a specific window of time the following week. Um, there will be a series of lottery numbers per window, right? So it's not just a single number at a time. It'll be a series of numbers for each window. And students should plan to log in as close to the start of that window as possible. Um, lottery numbers will help us do a couple of things. It'll help us to stagger access to the system so we don't overload it by sending everybody there at the same time. And it'll give everybody who's living on campus currently the same randomized chance um, for timely access to the system. One important distinction to make, however, is that a lottery number, simply getting a lottery number, does not guarantee that a student will be able to select the space. And so think of it like the real lottery. Real lottery doesn't guarantee you a prize, it guarantees you the opportunity to play. And so very similarly, a lottery number in this process gives you a chance to play that doesn't necessarily correspond with a bed space. Um, and so we can talk more about that as we go as well. We've indicated throughout that we made a few changes. One, to make it simpler. Two, to try and even the playing field. Uh, what we've tried to do is try and make as much of the inventory available for all individuals across um, the campus uh, for our returners. Um, one of the ways that we did this is by limiting our roommate groups. So as Elizabeth indicated in the uh, prior slide, what we did is, um, we had a tremendous response last year in order to try and make space available for additional folks for all room types. We limited to two people in a roommate group. And so what this slide is really talking about is one student can invite, can create a group and invite a second student. Uh, in order for that roommate group to be complete, that second student has to accept that invitation. Now, Roommate groups uh, are done within the application. Um, students will be able to create their roommate groups between January 22nd and the 26th. All parties in those roommate groups must have completed applications. Now, roommate groups are not guaranteed. And obviously what I've indicated is you have to make sure the invitation is made and the invitation is accepted. The other thing that dictates whether or not roommates are assigned to, together, in addition to the roommate group, it also has to have space available. So when the student goes out to select the space, they gotta find a space that has two vacancies in it. So one of the things that we've been asked is, okay, so how can four people get together? It will be more difficult for four people to get together because you will have to find a space that has four vacancies. It's not impossible, but it will be more difficult. Those are some of the difficult decisions that we had to make to make sure that more people had access to more room types so that all groups of four would not necessarily block out anyone else from living in Delt Hall, in Miltimore Hall, or whatever hall you want to. So again, those are some of the difficult decisions that we had to make. So as we mentioned, we have made some changes to our contract information. So um, the first state is the change for cancellation without financial obligation. As I mentioned, that has shifted up. So it was previously June 1st. It will now be April 1st. Um, so definitely want to make sure that students and families are considering their options and making those um, important decisions by April 1st to avoid any financial obligation. Uh, returning students will not be required to pay a $100 non-refundable housing application fee as long as they do participate um, in return to campus living. So that's definitely a benefit and a perk of going through this process is that you are not required to pay that non-refundable fee. Um, 
We do want to note that participation in RTCL does not guarantee housing. Here at Charlotte, we are not able to provide that guarantee. And so simply participating in the process um, will not guarantee you a, a space on campus. So lots of the questions we've gotten so far are, why are you making these changes? So as we've shared um, for a couple of reasons, first of all, we're pivoting to January to allow time um, to finalize these changes and communicate as thoroughly as we can with students and families and campus partners and to provide students with ample time to be able to weigh their decision or weigh their options and make some good decisions that fit for them. Um, we're also trying to be really responsive to student feedback and trends we've seen over the years. So as we've mentioned, we've heard from students and families that multiple phases and multiple steps in the process were too complicated. So we've tried to simplify it. We've also seen that students have used Return to Campus Living um, for many years as a backup. Um, so much so that we had 800 students last year who canceled, participated in Return to Campus Living, but canceled by the time August rolled around. That's 800 students we couldn't otherwise accommodate um, because we already told them no, right? We didn't have space. And so, um, so what we're trying to do is condense the process and um, help students understand on the front end what the limitations are so that they can make the right decisions for themselves. And for some students, that very well may be, I've got to live off campus to be able to accomplish what I want to accomplish. And as tough as that is for us to hear, we'd rather do that than overpromise and under deliver. Um, the bigger picture is that this helps us align our processes in a couple of different ways with the university's strategic planning and enrollment goals, um, with FAFSA changes, which have taken place this year. And um, it helps us to mirror best practices at other UNC system schools um, that are moving or have already moved in the direction of a first year live on requirement, which is where we're headed for 2025. We can't make those changes overnight. And so we've got to be able to lay that groundwork now um, and um, and so that's part of why this process is changing now, partly in response to feedback we've heard and partly to align with university goals and strategic planning and partly to prepare us for the future. For those of you who really appreciate give it to me straight, give it to me in step format so that I can understand what I need to do. It's as simple as this. You go to housing.charlotte.edu to initiate an uh, online housing application. Very similar to how you did uh, when you applied to live here the first time. You will be prompted to create a roommate group or you will accept a roommate group invitation. Please do the right, the smart thing. Um, if you have a desired roommate, make sure you chat with the roommate. Make sure they know what they're supposed to do because it's even if you invite them and they don't accept it, it's an incomplete roommate chain. The system will not read that. Um, you're gonna be asked to list preferences. Uh, you will then sign an annual housing contract. Please hear me when I say this. This is an annual academic year contract. I have so many students that I've spoken to who think they're only in it for the fall, but we are academic year based. So that would include fall semester and spring semester. Critical thing, Elizabeth talked about, this puppy opens up at 8 a.m. on January 22nd. So at 8 a.m. on January 22nd is when folks will be able to start applying. Then second step of these phases are receiving lottery numbers. Lottery numbers will correspond to a specific window of time. That is important to note. It means that it will identify the earliest time that you can log in and start selecting your space. So um, it doesn't mean that if you, you have a uh, lottery time that begins at 9 a.m., it doesn't mean you should not attend your class because you have a lottery uh, that begins at 9 a.m. It may mean that you may log in after your class at 940 or whatever the case may be. Um, there are a series of lottery numbers for each window. It does not guarantee that you're going to have a space. And again, 
The second date to remember is January 26th. That's when we'll be sharing um, those lottery numbers. Uh, the last piece, if you were to look at these in steps, um, uh, log in close to the start of your lottery window as, as soon as possible. Um, that is always a good idea. Um, these are randomized lottery numbers, so um, they are not at all uh, prioritized by time or classification or anything else. Um, make sure the roommate groups um, that you formed have, oh dear, uh, was that the hook? Did, did you actually get the hook so you took me off? Make sure the roommate groups that um, it's better to select the spaces uh, of, of the earliest person that has the earliest lottery number or lottery time. So that person may be the individual to go in and select the space. Make sure you select a room. Please do not think that we're going to assign you. You need to go in and select that room. And um, the windows will begin on January 29th. Hopefully all of that makes sense. So biggest takeaways um, to try to summarize what we've talked about so far is that Return to Campus Living will launch in January. We'll be going through lots of uh, marketing. Um, so students will know that it's going on, but it will begin on January 22nd at 8 a.m. We do want to note that there's no magic to logging on right at 8 a.m. Um, oftentimes we see that students are very eager to get their application in. Um, and so it can be a heavy load on our system as we're trying to um, open these applications. So it is important that they apply early. We don't want them to wait until the end of the week. But if it's, you know, 10 a.m. on the 22nd, um, that will be OK, too. Um, space for returning students will remain limited. We are trying to balance um, that support, as Christy talked about. So space for returning students is limited. The process will be simplified, but it will require students to apply at the beginning of the process, receive a lottery number, and then log back in. So this is different from our new application where students simply provide preferences and then we assign. They are hand selecting their space. A lottery number does not guarantee the opportunity to choose a space during open room selection. Uh, roommate groups will be limited to just two people. And then roommate groups or pairings are not guaranteed. They're dependent on the students um, successfully completing that process of an invitation, the other student accepting, and that space availability. There will not be um, same room selection this year, nor will there be a roommate pull-in or displacement period. Um, it will simply be applying, receiving the lottery number, and then going through the selection process. The first cancellation deadline, as we've mentioned a few times now, has moved up to April 1st, so definitely mark that on your calendar. We wanna make sure that you're able to make the decision to live on campus uh, by that time. Um, and then returning students who apply during return to campus living will not need to pay the non-refundable housing application fee. So for some additional important context, um, on-campus housing we know is very valuable, but it's also not unlimited. We have at most 6225. 6,225 beds. We don't have magic beds stashed anywhere. We don't have any immediate plans to build anything new. Um, and so that's a finite resource. And so somebody in the Q&A has already very helpfully asked, um, if it's return to campus living, why can't um, all returning students live on campus? It's simple math. We don't have enough beds for everybody who might want to live on campus. We can't give all the beds away at the beginning. We won't have any beds for new students. Um, and so again, we've got a balance. And, um, and so um, we're not designed to accommodate every student who may want to live on campus um, all four years. It's not, that's just not the kind of inventory we have. And we don't guarantee housing for students. And so we do give returning students 
the very first opportunity. But again, we know from last year's demand that it will be unlikely we'll be able to house every returning student who may want to live on campus. That demand has grown significantly in the last few years. Um, it used to be that students um, would spend, most students would spend their first year with us and then gradually move off campus. And that balance sort of took care of itself. Uh, but more and more, we see returning students want to stay on campus longer than they have historically. And we're at a point where we have to limit the amount of space for returning students. And so that creates a little bit of a run. Um, all of that's necessi ne necessitated changes to this process. We want you to know that we don't make these decisions in isolation here at Housing and Residence Life. We do that in close consultation with university leadership and our partners in enrollment management. And we do that to try to balance the needs of returning students with those of new students. Um, and we do that in ways um, that are critical to the support of um, the university's strategic planning and enrollment goals. The other thing that I've heard in the years that I've been here um, is, um, well, we didn't know. Uh, we didn't know that. We didn't have that information. We have spent so much time um, really trying to methodically lay out how we can keep all parties informed because we have so much to gain if folks understand exactly how this is going to work. So when you think about it, um, I want you to hear me when we say uh, these are some of the steps. This is the first of many steps. Um, actually, it's actually the second because the first we send an email out to all of our current residents telling them about return to campus living and that we would be doing this webinar and other things that would be forthcoming here in January. So what's gonna happen? We're gonna do a robust marketing plan, which includes generally tabling in the union, in the halls, uh, making the information available via flyers. We do a number of those things um, and doing information sessions to make sure that we can answer any questions that people have. We are planning an open house. Um, again, to try and make sure that folks understand the options that uh, are available. They understand what RTCL is about. That's the week of January 16th. RTCL application will open January 22nd, as we've indicated. The lottery numbers will be distributed January 26th. Now, the RTCL application is the only application you do. I see a, a, Q, a question in the Q&A about the lottery application. No such animal exists. There is a housing application that you will go to, housing.charlotte.edu, very similar to the application you initially used to apply for housing. Um, the lottery numbers, like I said, are gonna be distributed January 26th. Open room selection by lottery number time assignment that will begin January 26th. Uh, and then just as an aside, please understand that the reason we're telling you this is we want everyone to be informed while we recognize we can't be everything to everyone. We want you to be informed on the steps we're taking to make this happen. But for those of you who think that you might not be able to live on campus, we are also offering an off-campus housing and resource fair on February 6th. I also want to draw your attention down to um, the note at the bottom of this screen. There are some students who uh, are actually are in special categories with designated space. Um, such as honors, those with housing accommodations, sororities, um, who will not be able to select their exact space. If you are in that category, we will be reaching out to you with further guidance to let you know what you will need to do. Uh, but again, um, please, please, if, if you've never watched or read your emails in the past, these are emails you're gonna wanna make sure that you pay attention to, because this is gonna be the way we get information out to our current students. All right, so we're gonna take some time to answer questions. If you do have outstanding questions that you have uh, not yet dropped in that Q&A feature, feel free to do so now. 
Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started with some that have already been submitted. So we've seen several come through asking, what are the chances that a student will get housing on campus? Christy, do you want to take that one? Yeah, sure. Thanks. So um, this is where I wish we had a crystal ball, really, honestly, um, because that's really tough to gauge. That depends on a number of factors we don't yet know, um, including how many students might apply and how many students might actually choose to follow through and select a space in return to campus living. And so there is no reliable way for us to give you an estimate or a gauge of how likely it is for any particular student or group of students to successfully navigate return to campus living. And as a parent, I wish I could provide that information um, to folks. I know how helpful that would be. We would be only guessing and it would not be a particularly educated guess um, if we did. And so we're not being evasive, we just don't know because there are factors we can't quantify up front um, or estimate up front. And so we don't know. Our best guidance is what we have laid out tonight, which is encourage students and students who are on this call, pay attention to your email, pay attention, ask good questions, um, and participate in the process um, in a timely way um, in the month of January. That's, that's your best recourse, uh, but we can't begin to guess um, the likelihood for any of these students. Great. Um, so we've seen several questions come through regarding those roommates um, who may want to live with uh, two or three other people. Carla, can you talk to us about that process if there are three or four students that want to live together? Right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Essentially, what's going to happen is if you have two individuals who get into, let's say a four bedroom, four person apartment, and they've got two other individuals who are interested and in also living with them, it's gonna come down to if those other two people who are interested in living with their two friends already in a unit, they can, one, when they log in, they can look for that space, see if that is still a vacant space, because remember, we're going to have many people in there playing and vying for different spaces on campus. So yes, it is possible, but it would simply be, I'm on the phone talking to my friend saying, where did you land? Did you land in Belk 242? I'm going to look for Belk 242. I'm going to see if there are any vacancies in that unit. If so, if I'm one of the first ones to grab them for me and my desired roommate, that's how the four would get together. Um, so seeing other questions asking about special considerations um, for out-of-state students um, or for particular years, seniors versus sophomores, and how that relates to lottery numbers being generated. Um, Christy, do you want to speak to that? Sure. So um, lottery numbers will be... Uh, absolutely random. So there won't be a nod to off-campus or out-of-state students. There won't be a nod to um, to any sort of special need of any sort. Totally random. Um, those are not connected to when a student applies. So a student who um, applies at 8 a.m. on the 22nd um, is just as likely to get a good lottery number as somebody who might apply at 5 p.m. on the 22nd. And so there's no correlation there. There's no correlation between being out of state um, or part of a special population. Um, it'll be totally new. Great. So I do see, thank you so much, first of all, for submitting questions. They are coming in rapidly. Um, so as we go through that. Let me see. I have seen some questions regarding roommate groups and if you are required to have a roommate group to go through return to campus living. 
um, you are not required to have a roommate group. So if you have one other person that you'd like to go through the process with, great. You can complete that roommate group as part of step one in your application. Um, if you don't know anyone, that's okay too. You can, you'll be able to skip that step on part one. You'll still go in, apply for housing, uh, sign your contract, and then you'll just select a space on your own during the selection process. Um, a couple other questions related to roommate groups and how that works. Um, there's some questions about, would I still be able to select a four person uh, space even though I only have a roommate group of two. So yes, Carla spoke to that some already, but your group of two could select two of the four spaces. Um, so those, those rooms will still be available. Um, you'll just only pick the two. Um, okay, so looks like a little bit of clarification on the lottery system may be helpful as well. Um, some questions about the, there not being a guarantee of housing, um, even if you receive a lottery number, and asking for some, some elaboration on that. Christy, could you take that? Um, sure. So um, nobody in this process um, is, is guaranteed housing. Um, part of the reason we're moving to a lottery-based process is to try to level the playing field. Again, um, we know that there's a lot of demand on campus more than we can, for on-campus housing, more than we can meet. Um, and so, um, like other institutions our size, are moving to a process that gives everybody the equal opportunity uh, to potentially choose a space. Um, and so, um, those lottery numbers, again, won't be tied to the date of application per se, Right, students will still have to apply to be able to get a lottery number. Those lottery numbers will correspond with a specific window of time. So think move-in appointments. That's the best thing I can sort of liken it to. Um, students have been accustomed to signing up for move-in appointments. Um, and when we open that system, um, we give students a window of time when they can first access the system. And so those lottery windows are very similar. Um, if I get a certain um, if my lottery number falls within a certain set, let's say arbitrarily 50 numbers, right? We don't, we won't know what those will be until we know how many applications we've gotten. Um, but if we're using an example of 50, the first 50 students will get the first window, right? The, so numbers one through 50, if that's how we do it. Um, and so the, um, the earlier the number, the earlier that they'll be able to log in. That doesn't mean they have to log in at the time, but it would be beneficial for them to log in as close to the start of their time. So if the start of my lottery window is 9 a.m., I'll want to log in as close to 9 a.m. Um, as I can. But everybody else that has a number in that same range will be able to log in in that same window. People will get, students will get an error message if they try to log in um, and it's not within their window. They'll be able to log in anytime after that, but they won't be able to log in before their window starts. Um, and so again, that's to stagger access to the system so we don't send everybody to it at the same time, but also to try to level the playing field a little bit um, to give people as much of an equal access to the system, um, an equal chance at the system as possible. Some, um, some other questions regarding um, selecting a space. So I do want to note that students will, again, first apply, receive a lottery number, they'll receive their time that they can log in, and then they will actually select the space. So let's say that they want to live in Levine Hall in Unit 101. They'll be able to select Levine Hall 101, Bed Space 1 they will know at that time exactly what space that they're assigned to. So that does, again, look different if you have, um, if your student has only ever gone through the, the new student application process, they gave us preferences, we assign them and let them know. In this process, they will select their own space. At that time, as, assuming they've completed every step and they click finish, that space is then locked in for them. I think there are some questions in here about when will they know that that's their space. Um, at that time, as assuming that they click finish, 
uh, to save all of their progress up until that point, then they have locked in that space for the next year and they will know that. Um, our team is here eight to five, Monday to Friday. So they are welcome to give us a call. We can verify. Um, and we're, we're even here to help them as they are going through that selection process uh, should they run into any challenges. Um, several questions about uh, special groups. So I just want to reiterate um, what we mentioned earlier. If your student is a part of um, a special group that has designated space, just encourage them to watch their email. They will receive some information specific to their situation. Um, so just encourage them to take a look at that um, and certainly give us a call if they do have additional questions. Right, so take one more pass through. Um, we appreciate your time tonight and we appreciate you participating in this webinar. Um, there is a really great question asking if there um, are spaces online where you are able to view the halls that are available um, in terms of what they look like. So um, that's something I personally feel very strongly about because I work with our student team who provides tours of our residence halls. So they've taken a great amount of time to put together virtual tours of all of our halls on campus. I encourage you to visit our website to be able to review those types of spaces online. You can watch the virtual tours. We also have a few halls open um, each day. So if they wanted to see certain room types, we do have a couple of showrooms during the academic year where they could take a look at that. All righty. So at this point, um, I am going to pass it back over to Christy and see if there are any other things she might want to share with us tonight. But thank you all so much for participating. Thanks, Elizabeth. So um, we did our best to um, address all of the really great questions, um, or as many of the really great questions you all asked as possible. Um, we would need hours um, to address these in the level of detail you might need. So um, here's our office information, as well as how to contact us. Email is probably your best bet, um, but we'd also say be patient, right? We copied and pasted all of these great questions. They'll help us sort of flesh out website content and other information that'll be coming as part of that robust marketing plan Carla spoke about. Um, and so... Um, if you have other um, more pressing needs um, in your lives or in your students' lives, focus on those um, for the next couple of weeks um, and trust that um, we'll take all of these great questions and somehow um, translate those into some good content um, that will be available online and in other ways. Um, but if you've got some burning questions um, and need some answers, you're welcome to reach out or better yet, have your students reach out um, to us. As Elizabeth shared, we're here um, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, and we would say check back on our website um, as we get closer to January um, because lots of this detail will be available on the website um, and in lots of other forms. Um, and so we're so glad you joined us. Um, we will be posting this webinar um, most likely tomorrow. So stay tuned um, for that. It will likely um, go to YouTube um, with much of our other video content. There's also some great video tours. I want to um, reemphasize that um, if your students are interested in seeing some spaces, we've got some great video tours um, online and lots of great information about the halls online as well. Um, and so look for this um, webinar to be posted um, tomorrow or in the next couple of days. Um, for you to refer back to or have your students review um, and then let us know how we can be of support um, with other information as we get closer to Jane. So again, thanks for being here. Thanks for joining us this evening. We know you had a million other things you could have been doing tonight. So thanks for spending a little bit of that time with us. We really appreciate it. Take care and we'll, we hope to talk to you soon. Bye now.